This evening on The Rock Newman Show, Dr. Sheila Walker is a cultural anthropologist and filmmaker known for tracing the roots and history of the slave trade. She'll discuss the contributions of the African diaspora in the new world and beyond. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Dr. Sheila Walker has spent a lot of time over the years visiting communities of African descendants all around the world. She's been to South Carolina, Brazil, El Salvador, and Turkey to name a few. Here's an interview that she conducted in India. When you see black Americans, what do you think? Black American and we, we are brothers. Why? 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 Why are you brothers? <laughs> you're brothers just because you're black? I do some like, like this. Black hat, skin. Thank you, so welcome, and thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. First, I described in the opening that Dr. Sheila Walker was a cultural anthropologist. Indeed. In the words of my beloved mom, what do that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote an article for Essence Magazine in the early 70s. Yeah when Essence had just uh, begun, and it was called something like Anthropology, What's That? Mm -hmm. And what, one of the things I explained was, well, now, when I say I'm an anthropologist, people say, oh, oh, that's very interesting, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, so you dig up all those bones and things, mm -hmm. and I say, no, I'm a cultural anthropologist, live people. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, want, I want people who sing, dance, eat, and mm -hmm. so what I study is culture, what do we do, what are our ceremonies, what, what do we eat, that's part of culture. Uh, how do we talk, how mm -hmm. do we use our bodies? Mm -hmm. So it's human behavior in groups, um, identity, all that's cultural anthropology, but I don't dig and I don't get my fingernails dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you about South Carolina and Geechee country. Mm -hmm. And you made a reference, and you said, mm, some there I noticed that the body language was African. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> well, the first place I went was Defusky Island. And that's, um, I think it's the most remote island. Uh, you have to, at that point, there was no public transportation. Mm -hmm. I had to go, somebody had to pick me up on mm -hmm. the mainland. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, there's the language factor. Yes. When I called Mr. Jake, he said, let me, talk, let, me let you talk to my son. You'll yeah. understand him better. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Mr. Jake came, got me, took me to Miss Bertha's with, with whom I stayed. And when I got to her house, she was sitting uh, in front of the house with food in a bowl. She was eating with, uh, she had her legs spread like an older woman has the right to do. Mm -hmm. uh, she had her head tied up okay. <laughs> and okay. she was eating out of the bowl with a tablespoon. Okay. And it was something like catfish and grits uh -huh. with gravy. Mercy. And I thought, I've seen this woman in Cameroon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eating out of the bowl uh -huh. with the spoon or her hands uh -huh. um, with her. We picked okra. Yeah. I've never picked okra. I'm from Jersey. We don't pick okra. Okay. <laughs> um, her companion, Mr. Thomas, started telling stories about Big Massa and the critters. And okay. I thought, wow, animal stories. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. where we get like uh, Br'er Rabbit mm -hmm. and stuff. So I thought, wow, this is a piece of Africa detached. <laughs> uh -huh. And you know what? That would just really walks me right into uh, what is what is another question. We we hear the word oftentimes, the African diaspora. And 
Define that force. <laughs> Define that di diaspora force. Okay, it's a word I like. Okay. And it's very simple. Okay. Dia, like diameter, across. Uh -huh. Spora, like the spores on a fern. Okay. When the, when the uh, wind blows, the spores, the seeds of the fern, plant themselves. Yeah. So it's the replanting of people uh, outside of their original homeland. Mm -hmm. So the replanting of people of African origin around the world. So to sow, S-O-W, like sowing seeds, sure. to sow across. So uh -huh. we've been sown across the world. Uh -huh. And indeed Africans have. Yeah, absolutely, from the beginning. You were a 19-year-old student at Bryn Mawr College, just outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. When you took your first international trip, you went to Cameroon. So if you could walk us back to that time, that having been an African-American student, let me see, and when you were there, you, were, you, you weren't African-American, you were ne black or Negro. I wasn't black. Uh -huh. I was Negro or colored. You were Negro or colored right. when you were in college. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so then, and you were one of two, but the other one left and left you Alone. solo right. as the only <laughs> colored Negro exactly. at that college. You leave there and you go to Cameroon. Tell us about that visit to Cameroon and how it changed your perspective of the world. Uh. Well, it, cha it changed, it made me who I am today, that trip to Cameroon. And Tell us all about that. <laughs> initially, when I was at Bryn Mawr, it was kind of a plantation mm -hmm. with the maids and porters, all black, who lived across the tracks mm -hmm. or in attics. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were supposed to call us Miss. We were not supposed to call them by any title. Mm -hmm. you know, so these elders were Venus and Louise, and, uh -huh. and we were Miss. So. Mm -hmm. Africa was a nice balance <laughs> for that. It changed the whole color spectrum. First, first tell me mm -hmm. this. W what was your reason for going there? How did you get to go to Cameroon? Well, I just wanted to go someplace. Mm -hmm. When I was, uh, it all started when I was four. I think mm -hmm. that's when I started to become an anthropologist. I had an aunt who lived in Chinatown in New York, and uh -huh. she had no kids and no television. Uh -huh. And so I would look out of the window at the Chinese people. Uh -huh. And at that point, Chinatown was really Chinatown. Yeah. It had pagoda roofs yeah. and things. Uh -huh. And I was just fascinated by people who spoke a language I didn't understand. Yeah. I was learning how to read and write. There's a lot of writing in Chinatown. Uh -huh. But I couldn't, where's cat? Where's dog? Where yeah. were the words and the letters I knew? Right. Um, the, I loved to look at the restaurants with those naked ducks hanging by their neck. That was fascinating. Uh -huh. And so that made me know that there were other people, other places who did things differently. Uh -huh. And so so I was always curious from then on about who's out there in the world doing something else. I had a feeling that Jersey wasn't everything. It wasn't the end of the world. Right. Uh -huh. There was more to it than that. Okay. So when I got to college, I went to I chose a college that had a junior year abroad program, so uh -huh. I could go someplace. Uh -huh. And someplace in that uh, in that era was France. Right. It's okay. It was someplace else. Right. But I met um, an African American diplomat who told me about the experiment in international living, and they had. Well, most of their programs were to Europe, but they had one African country, uh -huh. and it was Cameroon. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, I'll just go to Cameroon. Sure. And it was, it couldn't have been better. What year is this? Uh, 64. Okay. Yeah, July 64. Okay. Couldn't have been better. Uh -huh. um, it, I, it, it's a rich, a culturally rich country, very diverse, uh -huh. and I lived in a kingdom. Mm -hmm. Had a king, had a palace. Uh -huh. King only had about 46 wives at the time. Only? Only. Uh -huh. His father had had many more. Did he try to make you one of his wives? Well, I, see, I was, wor I was w a anticipating that. Uh -huh. No. Mm. I was a little disappointed. Uh-huh. Oh, well. okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I thought, you know, he could, like, offer. Yeah. Uh-huh. No. Um, but I did get some offers, of course. Uh-huh. <laughs> like the family I lived with. They had a son who was studying in the States. Uh -huh. And so they thought, hmm, he might want to bring one of them back. Let's choose her. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> so one day, he'd been there for about a week, so I still hardly knew him. Right. He said, um, I could be everything to you. Mm. And I said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, well, I'm your brother, right, yeah. because you're living with my family. Yeah. I'm your grandfather, mm. you're my grandfather, <laughs> because he had inherited the property okay. of his grandfather, uh -huh. 
and that also gave him symbolically his identity. Uh -huh. So he became the grandfather, grandfather to his own brothers and sisters uh -huh. and me. Uh -huh. And so if I were to marry him, uh -huh. then he'd be everything. Mercy. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't. Yeah. And that was okay. But the family was very conscious of Pan-Africanism. They knew about the civil rights struggle. Uh -huh. They listened to all that on shortwave radio. Uh -huh. um, and I said, well, why are you interested in that? in our civil rights struggle. And they said, it's the same struggle, mm -hmm. your civil rights and our independence. They had just been independent for four years in uh -huh. uh, 1964. Yeah. And that's when we had the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were parallels that they saw. I didn't see them. Uh -huh. I didn't learn any of this mm -hmm. in my you know, fashion, fashionable Eastern women's school. Uh -huh. um, they asked me, uh, well, did you bring us any records? Uh -huh. Now, I didn't acknowledge that I didn't think they knew about records or had electricity. Uh -huh. And they said, well, if you didn't bring us any of your music, let us play some of your music for you. Hello. <laughs> you want to hear Harry Belafonte? Uh -huh. Maybe Ray Charles. Mm. What about Mahalia? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so they, right up front, let me know that they knew about a bigger world than I knew about. Uh -huh. And I was part of this big world uh -huh. that they were interested in when they, when they had... Let, let mm -hmm. me ask you something right there. Because there's something that I... I've noticed, I've observed. By and large, I'm going to stereotype, which is something one should not do, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyhow. By and large, Americans think, oftentimes, behave in a way, oftentimes, that the world ends between the Atlantic and the Pacific, mm -hmm. and that we really know better than anybody else. And here you are as a college student traveling to Cameroon, just recently having gotten its independence, and you're with a family who actually seemed to me to be much more worldly than you were at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. They asked me questions like, do you know Sparrow from Trinidad? Mm. But, um, well, maybe. Uh -huh. What about Pelé from Brazil? Oh, uh -huh. Who? Yeah. Where? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how I began to know there was an African diaspora. Uh -huh. This Cameroonian family, my Cameroonian parents had not been, my Cameroonian mother had been to second grade, my Cameroonian father had been to se uh, high school. Right. And then at that point, that was a lot. Uh -huh. Um, and he became a teacher, okay. and at the, when I was there, he was like the lieutenant governor of the the. He the, really had it going on. The region, he yeah. Teacher, lieutenant governor, he the king. Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't the king. Oh, no. okay. But that was a rel. The king was a relative. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, oh no, he wasn't the king too. <laughs> but that's exact. That was exactly my experience. Here mm -hmm. I am. I'm I'm going to this fashionable college. You know, I'm yeah. supposed to be learning stuff. Sure. And these Africans know so much more about the world than I do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And they were determined they were going to teach me stuff, uh -huh. and they did. Um, so that's where I began to become an African diasporan. We, uh, and this was a time when those sociologists who studied us told us we African Americans yeah. didn't have any culture. Mm -hmm. If we had any culture, it was pathological. Yeah. And we certainly didn't have any African culture, and why yeah. would we want it? It yeah. wasn't civilized. Exactly. Uh, because yeah. if you watch the Tarzan movies, which were popular during that time, absolutely. why <laughs> would you want African culture? Right. Here's this white man who is smarter than all these Africans right. in their own environment. That's right. Well, I didn't meet him. Uh -huh. He wasn't there. Didn't see him? <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the, to talk a little bit about the king, the father of the king when I was there, uh -huh. um, who was, he was the king at the beginning of the 20th century, uh -huh. King Joya. Uh -huh. um, he's a, he's a, a legend. Okay. He created a writing system for his language. Okay. He wrote books of the writing system. He, uh -huh. he created schools uh -huh. in which his writings were taught. Uh -huh. And when the French came to colonize, one of the first things they did was close his schools. Yeah. And I thought, uh-huh, wasn't that lo like we weren't, during slavery, yeah. allowed to know how to read and write? Sure, right? sure. He also built a palace out of traditional materials, uh -huh. but in a European style, mm. and it's been restored by UNESCO. Uh -huh. So this was a great place for me to start my African experiences. Yeah. And they have a, a very um, rich artistic tradition, mm -hmm. um, uh, lost wax bronze casting, mm -hmm. uh, beadwork, a lot yeah. of stuff. What Good. were you studying at Bryn Mawr? 
<laughs> Initially, I was studying political science because okay. I thought, I wanted to travel. How do you travel? Yeah. Well, be a diplomat. Mm -hmm. Then, when I got to Cameroon, I met some of the diplomats. Mm -hmm. The colored man was not there when I was there. There was mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. but he was gone when I went to the embassy. I didn't think I wanted to work with these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked one man what he thought about Cameroonian food. Yeah. Just, you know, making conversation. Sure. And he'd only been there for two years, and he said, I think I've had some. Mm. In two years, he right. thought he'd had some, and what he thought he had had was some grilled meat, uh -huh. like uh -huh. grilled beef. Right. Cameroonian food is very rich, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of variety, it's mm -hmm. delicious, mm -hmm. and that's where I began to learn about the cultural continuum from Africa to the Americas. Mm -hmm. Initially, the family had, they would serve like french fries. Yeah. And grilled chicken, okay. stuff I was accustomed to. Right. And then suddenly one day, uh -huh. it was different. There was fufu uh -huh. and some kind of green sauce. Yeah. And I thought, <sighs> the fufu looked like uncooked bread dough to okay. me. Okay. And uh, I didn't like that sauce. Right. Well, eventually I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. The fufu ce ceased to look like uncooked bread dough and mm. started to look like grits. And so that first <laughs> trip, how long did you stay? Two months. And when you came back to the States, mm -hmm. what was the difference in Sheila Walker oh. from when she first left? <laughs> totally different. First of all, um, I, well, the kind of questions that people asked me mm -hmm. were, well, did you live in a tribe? Mm -hmm. And that was, what's a tribe? That's what you see on Tarzan, right? Yeah, I, yeah. And I would say, no, I lived in a house. Uh. <laughs> mm -hmm. With hot running water, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And we had servants, yeah. <laughs> unlike in East Orange, New Jersey. Yeah. So I was living high. Yeah. I mean, it was when I look back at the house, it wasn't so fancy, but sure. it was fine. Sure, sure. You know, it, was, um, it wasn't what I expected. I thought I was going to live in something made out of mud bricks mm -hmm. with, thatch, with a thatch roof. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, we had two vehicles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And one day I went for a walk with my Cameroonian brothers, and um, they just were showing me around the, the town. And I called it the village, and they kept correcting me, mm -hmm. the town. Okay. And I said, the village, this is a town, this is not a village. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> what, what's the difference? Right. You know, right. it's Africa, right. it must be a village. Sure. They said, well, we have a hotel, we have a gas station. Uh -huh. We have a hospital. Uh -huh. We have administrative buildings. Uh -huh. This is a town. Mm -hmm. I realize, yeah, I guess it is a town. Plus, it had a palace yeah. and two museums, uh -huh. which we didn't have in East Orange, New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of put me in my place and made me, well, first of all, just being there, living with these people who were so hospitable, mm -hmm. made me want to travel more, mm -hmm. see who else was out there. Right. Uh, and I expected the same sort of reception, positive reception, and generally I've gotten it because I guess I expect that. Um, when I, uh, I came back uh, and had one year, one more year of college, I was too busy just trying to get out of there. I switched sure. my major from political science because meeting the diplomats, uh -huh. I thought, I don't want to work with these guys. Yeah, yeah. I want to be in Cameroon with Cameroonians. Uh -huh. If I go to Peru, I want to be in Peru with Peruvians. Okay. I don't want to go and stay in the U.S. bubble. Yeah. So. I found out about anthropology. I uh -huh. met an anthropologist who was there, uh -huh. and he was talking about the research he was doing. And I thought, oh, that sounds good. That's another way to travel. And that way I can do what I want. I won't represent a government. Uh -huh. I only represent me. Uh -huh. And these, these, this Cameroonian family put me on that path. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not just by introducing me to the anthropologist, but, making, but by making me want to know more. Uh -huh. And we had a party. And I thought, oh wow, African drums, African yeah. you know, costumes and sure. stuff. Wrong, uh -huh. <laughs> wrong. Uh -huh. The music was Afro-Cuban. Yeah. And they said, how come you can dance to our music? I said, that's not your music. I dance to this in Jersey. Yeah. And we were a group, uh -huh. and the other people in the group were not African Americans. Mm. And my, the Cameroonians are like, well, how come you can dance? And what's wrong with them? Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. And that was a moment of. She's one of uh, she's one of ours. Mm -hmm. I think that party mm -hmm. and the dancing mm -hmm. was a real revelation mm -hmm. to them. It's like, uh huh. Well, hmm. there was a connection. Yeah, yeah. So you come back, you uh, switch your major, you have another year. <coughs> Excuse me, and then 
<laughs> there is the yearning, then there is the yearning to start this diaspora thing? Well, I had to go to graduate school first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I went to graduate school in mm -hmm. cultural anthropology. Mm -hmm. And um, there, I was kind of between two tendencies. Mm. Anthropology is a colonial science. Mm -hmm. The colonials studied the natives so as to know how to better control them. Mm -hmm. Uh, to see hum the evolution of humanity, the natives being at a lower level of evolution mm -hmm. than the European mm -hmm. anthropologists, presumably. Mm -hmm. But I thought, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought, oh, wow, you know, I mm -hmm. get to hang out with more people like these interesting Cameroonians. Mm -hmm. But this was also the 60s, yeah. right? This is the yeah. beginning of black power. Yeah. This is black militancy. Yeah. Yeah. So here I have these colonial white professors, all mm -hmm. male, mm -hmm. by definition at that point, mm -hmm. And the militants are saying, now, nah, hey, sister, now, are you black or are you not? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. But what was black? Now, for them, um, the black was more narrow than I had just learned in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Cameroon mm -hmm. helped me defend myself mm -hmm. against these, these, my professors who were still trying to tell us we didn't have any culture. Yes. And the militants who were trying to be too narrow. Because uh -huh. I now, I, I spent a year in Paris after Cameroon, yeah. and I hung out with black folks from all kinds of places. So now you, you, you refer to a, as the militants. Mm -hmm. So what about their ideology <laughs> made them too narrow? Well, uh, I wanted to go skiing. Black folks don't ski. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, but why? Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> I want to go eat some Greek food. Mm -hmm. No, that ain't black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why? You know, mm -hmm. I want to be in the world. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I had oh. experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in Paris, I hung out with Afro-Cubans, mm -hmm. people from various places in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. various kinds of Africans from different places. And you, places. this was at Chicago University. Mm -hmm. Did you feel as if you were a misfit? Uh, well, I felt that I would be much more appreciated <laughs> than I was. Mm -hmm. I thought that there'd be more appreciation among these anthropologists mm -hmm. for my culture. Yeah. I wanted to do my, my uh, doctoral dissertation on elements of African American culture. Uh -huh. And so when I met with the, the professors, one of them said, well, give me an example of some African American culture. And I, I said, well, the dozens. Yeah. And yeah. he said, the dozens are dead. Now, a friend of mine said, he better come over to the hood and tell my kids that yeah. the dozens are yeah. dead. Because yeah. they be playing the dozens mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Your mama be coming off their lips on a regular basis. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I was in this very unsupportive environment for... Did he have any idea what you meant when you said the dozens? And then for him to say that the dozens <laughs> are dead? That's a good point. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he's the expert. Yeah. Of course he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, did he really know? I don't know. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. I also, what I learned was these are the people who are going to deci decide my fate. So for me to write about African American culture that they're trying to convince me doesn't exist is yeah. like sending the fox to get the chickens. Very, so you find <laughs> yourself in chicken. a very interesting <laughs> position. Yeah, yeah. So tell me how you navigated that because I hear you. <laughs> I think I hear you. I think I hear you saying to tell your truth. Mm -hmm you know that the truth that you're telling is more than likely going to get slapped down. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. Have, you're you on a mission to get a PhD. Right. So what did you do? <laughs> Fortunately, I met Prince Charming. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Prince Charming, at that point, had a, ch a choice between peace and war. Get drafted, go to Vietnam, or join the Peace Corps. Uh-huh. So being a smart man, okay. Prince Charming chose the Peace Corps. Uh-huh. Went to Ivory Coast. Mm. You don't meet Prince Charming every day. Mm. So I thought, well, I was going to go to Brazil. Brazil will be there. I'll go to Ivory Coast. Uh -huh. And so I studied a church in Ivory Coast and so, so, something non-threatening. Uh -huh. And I wrote about that. Uh -huh. um, and it was an African Christian church, a church that was founded by an African who'd been, um, what, Christianized by missionaries. And <laughs> but Interesting world <laughs> yeah. we live in. Right. Then and now. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Let me ask you something. You, you, you said in the African Christianity, and they preach. Two questions. One, was there a white Jesus in the church? And two, was the, how was the preaching different than what you might have been used to in the States? <laughs> there was no white Jesus. There was not? There was no Jesus. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> because it seems that the understanding was that the creator, uh -huh. and that there was a God, there was a picture of God, okay. a painting of God, and he was white, the white, wear, white man with the white hair. Mm. Um, so I guess that was God. Mm -hmm. But God had several sons. And since Jesus was white, he went to France. Harris, the African, was God's son for the Africans. So mm -hmm. he was the prophet for the Africans. Mm -hmm. And what, um, what this was about was essentially Africans saying, okay, these, people, these, these Europeans have essentially conquered us. So they must have some really strong juju and we better learn it. <laughs> That's the strong juju. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's learn their, their version of spirituality. Mm -hmm. Not all of it, though. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we don't want to learn those songs. No, we got our own songs, and we have to have some rhythm yeah. with our songs. Yeah. And so the style, I mean, they would break out into song. Mm -hmm. um, they would have a procession to church with mm -hmm. you know, a, little, a little rhythm mm -hmm. and some instruments. Mm -hmm. um, so it was lively. You know, it wasn't like what the missionaries had intended. Uh -huh. This was African Christianity. And mm -hmm. one of the big movements in Africa is Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, Christ isn't in it necessarily. Uh -huh. I mean, I talked about this to some theologians and they said, wait a minute, you said it's Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, where's Christ? Yeah. Like, well, uh, he's just not there. Mm -hmm. Harris is the prophet. Mm -hmm. And they, but they consider themselves Christians, so it's not up to me to mm -hmm. decide that they're not just because mm -hmm. there's no Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but essentially, what they were preaching was, um, let me see, they had been conquered by these Europeans, so co colonialism had begun. Yeah. How were they going to adjust to it? Mm -hmm. So this was a way of adapting, adopting mm -hmm. a colonial mm -hmm. uh, institution mm -hmm. and trying to put it to the service of their own issues. Mm -hmm. and now. The um, the those who are, have are advanced in Christianity have done m more of a job since then because today in churches in Africa you see a white Jesus. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah, it seems to me. Okay, so you so so you're there, and so where was your tell us about your journey after there? You went and now you really now you really got this di diaspora bug. Okay. Yeah, well, while I was in Africa, I traveled all over the place okay. by all kinds of means. Uh -huh. And I, I got to know people from other places. Uh -huh. And so then I needed to visit them. So I went to the Caribbean, to Martinique, Guadeloupe. Um, well, if I'm going to go that far, I might as well go to Brazil, uh -huh. right? And yeah. ah, Colombia. So yeah. initially, I didn't know about all the black folks in so many places. Okay. There was a conference in Colombia in 1977 uh -huh. in Cali on the Pacific coast of Colombia. Now, okay, Colombia has a Caribbean coast. It makes sense to me that they're black folks. Mm -hmm. Pacific Ocean, black mm -hmm. folks? Mm -hmm. We went to a town called Buenaventura, yeah. a coastal town, yeah. and I thought I was in Africa. And to make things more complex, this Afro-Colombian came and started talking to me in perfect ebonics. Ebonics. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did you learn to talk like us? Where are you from? I'm from here. How did you learn to talk like us? Merchant Marines, African American merchant Marines taking African American culture uh -huh. around the world. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That was startling to me. But to just to be on the Pacific coast uh -huh. of South America uh -huh. and to think I was in Africa and uh -huh. I, I, I met an Afro Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian uh -huh. and I said, I didn't know there were black folks in Ecuador. Yeah. He said, Dance with me, sister. Then you'll know <laughs> there uh -huh. are black folks in Ecuador. Uh -huh. Wow. Wow. <laughs> what an answer. Yeah. So having met these folks, um, then I figured, well, got to find where else are we? Yeah. I went to a conference in Argentina, and there was a big reception at a fancy place. And I said, are there any Afro-Argentinians here? Yeah. The conference was about black culture, mm -hmm. um, but as appropriated by white Argentinians who religiously have become Yoruba. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so are there any black, uh, are, there, are, there, are there any Afro-Argentinians here? There's one. <laughs> so I went over and said, eres Argentina. Uh -huh. <laughs> Soy Argentina, existes, existo. So she exists uh -huh. as an Afro-Argentinian. Yeah. And then with her, I met people from Uruguay, and then with them, I met people from Paraguay. Uh -huh. So I just kept meeting all these folks from various places in the Americas, Chile. There's not a country where we're not. Okay, so you kept, me you kept meeting these folks. 
tell us about your visits. I mean, you, like you, 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 Brazil, Ecuador, uh, <laughs> uh, India. T t tell us about. We have a video. We, I think we played early the video. <laughs> but I think we have one from Brazil. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience. <laughs> well, um, I went to Brazil to spend two weeks, yeah. and I spent two weeks and three months. Uh -huh. I went to Bahia, okay. and I had intended to go to Brazil to do uh, my dissertation research, but then I went to Ivory Coast because okay. of Prince Charming. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I still had to satisfy Brazil. And why did I have to go to Brazil? It was all because of seeing them ladies get happy in church uh -huh. in Newark, New Jersey, uh -huh. and not understanding this issue of the spirit. What is this spirit? Yeah. Why does the spirit act like that? So uh -huh. I wanted to, I, I figured, um, I'd read about Brazil and the Afro-Brazilian religion, and I thought there are some answers there. I went to Brazil. They in Bahia. They say uh, I went to Bahia. Mm. <laughs> um, Bra the Bahia casts a spell on you. Well, the spell worked. On you? On me. <laughs> After two weeks, I said, "Well, I'm leaving now. Maybe in another week." Uh. And at the end of that week, well, I really have to go. What was it that was Maybe in you? another week. I w the, the, the religion, uh -huh. the food, it was such an African place in the Americas. Uh -huh. Plus, I was, um, it, it, th there was so much mystery to learn about. Because here is mainly Yoruba religion that's been recreated in the Americas. Uh -huh. It wasn't the kind of stripped down Protestantism that we have. You know, we got the music, we got yeah. the getting happy. Yeah. But they have outfits, they have food, they have drums, they have ceremonies. Spiritual uh -huh. beings enter into the bodies of people, just like when people are filled with the spirit in our churches, uh -huh. right? Well, uh -huh. there, when I, was, when I saw the getting happy in Hopewell Baptist Church in North New Jersey, uh -huh. I wanted to know, where does the spirit come from? Why yeah. does spirit act like this? Uh -huh. What's the spirit's name? Uh -huh. There were no answers to that. Uh -huh. In Bahia, the spirit came from Africa. The spirit's name was Yemanja or Shango or Oshun. What, why did the spirit dance? The spirit was dancing his or her role in the cosmos. That was pretty fascinating stuff to me. Uh -huh. So I had to, I, every time I got to know a little bit, I had to try to get to know a little bit more. Uh -huh. So finally, after two, two weeks and three months, I had to go back to my job. I or some while you were there. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. you're talking about the spirit. And mm -hmm. So as you are observing this, did you internalize any of it? Did you ever get the Holy Ghost? <laughs> I wondered if I was going to get that. <laughs> no, it never happened. Okay. okay. Um, but one of the things that the priestesses and priests, and there are more priestesses, will mm -hmm. tell you mm -hmm. who your guarding, guardian and guiding Orishas are, this, the Yoruba spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. Um, so they tell you that, or they throw cowrie shells, they do divination, right. so that you have a sense of who's supposed to be guiding you and taking care of you, mm -hmm. and what your characteristics are supposed to be like. It's kind of like us in the Zodiac. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if um, a man's Orisha is Ogun, he will be expected to be maybe into technology, mm -hmm. maybe into things involving war. Uh, of being a cop or a, um, a soldier. Mm -hmm. But he could be a computer programmer too, mm -hmm. <laughs> or an inventor of mechanical things, because mm -hmm. Ogun was in charge of iron mm -hmm. technology. Right. Um, a woman who's very vain. Mm -hmm. um, people would assume that Horisha just might be Oshun, because Oshun is very vain, likes gold, okay. uh, very sensuous. Mm -hmm. So they have ca characteristics. Mm -hmm. So I was just fascinated by all this because mm -hmm. it was so much, there, there was so much more pageantry, mm -hmm. so much more meaning, and it was so, it was, it's part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, people will just meet you and say, oh, you're Arisha, must be. Did you attend church when you got back from Brazil after that experience? I've never been a regular churchgoer, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, sometimes. Did you find yourself yawning? <laughs> I like to go to lively churches. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but our churches are a little one-dimensional as compared to what goes on in Brazil. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not dancing around in circles mm -hmm. to drums with outfits on. <laughs> so you now are somewhere in your 30s around that time? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 
you are making this connection that there is serious connection. All of these different places that you're visiting mm -hmm. back to the continent. Absolutely, absolutely. And I could, it was so, having gone to Ivory Coast rather than Brazil and having traveled around in various places in Africa allowed mm -hmm. me to just recognize stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember walking into one candomblé that's what the Afro-Brazilian, one, one of the terms used for the Afro-Brazilian religion in Bahia. There's a lot of variety in the Afro-Brazilian religion, but mm. so let's, I like to be as specific as possible. I walked into a, a compound of one of the, the major candomblé houses. Mm -hmm. The smells took me to Africa, mm. just the smells, the look of the land. <laughs> the, um, so the, the, the fact of having been to a lot of places in Africa just made things familiar, recognizable. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, my world was getting so much bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was all my world. You know, these are the same people who get the spirit in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Then, though, I, I'm st I was still Atlantic. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. knew about the Americas. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling very... Um, Oh, very enhanced mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. by knowing about the Americas. So it's mm -hmm. very hard for me to just talk about the United States because I'm always spilling beyond the borders. Yeah. Then in 19, no, in 2004, I got an email about a conference in, on the African diaspora in Asia to be held in Goa in India. Mm. I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. Um, I almost bought a ticket, a plane ticket right away, mm -hmm. except <laughs> it would have been a year too early <laughs> because I got this invitation in 2004. The thing was in 2006. Mm. Mm. So, but I couldn't wait to go to India. Yeah. Wow. You know, I'd heard that there were Afro-Indians, sure. but hearing and seeing mm -hmm. are totally different. Mm -hmm. And um, I harassed the organizer terribly because he said well, there, there are going to be visits after, so you can, you can go here, you can go here. Can I go to all these places? With, with <laughs> how far are they from each other? Is there time to go to all of them? Mm -hmm. And he said, calm. <laughs> He'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. now, I know better. I know I can't know in advance. Yeah. I know that when I get there, stuff is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go to, I'll get to go to more places than I have time to go to, and I'll need to go back. Mm -hmm. But India was great. Um, so the conference was in India Goa. was great. What yeah. stands out? Oh, <laughs> color, color. Uh, there are, I don't know, 300 zillion people in India. Mm -hmm. The women all wear a garment that is similar mm -hmm. to us. There are all these different ways of tying it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't recognize all the different ways. They. Mm -hmm. it, no, no two women I saw out of the 300 zillion people mm -hmm. had the same pattern on. Mm. They all looked totally different. Mm -hmm. So, just the... I heard, my wife spent six weeks in Kerala and then Ooh, some other parts. Yeah. And she and Dick Gregory were having a conversation. They must have talked 15 or 20 minutes about the aroma, mm -hmm. about the smell, mm -hmm. about the aroma mm -hmm. of India mm -hmm. and how it was unlike anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. You're shaking your head. Oh, yeah. Tell yeah. me about it. Oh, I love Indian food. Uh -huh. I mean, I had Indian food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh -huh. all the time. I understood eating in India. I understood why those Europeans braved sea monsters mm -hmm. to go look for some spices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they knew there were sea monsters, mm -hmm. right? But over there were those spices that made stuff delicious. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, so so in India, mm -hmm. in, in in India, how much did colonization cause normal Indian population to look down on Africans, if if at all? <sighs> Yeah, I think most Indians don't know anything about Africans or even notice that there are Afro-Indian populations. Um, yeah, I, I think India is just so Indian mm -hmm. that colonization influenced a small group. Mm -hmm. 
it's like being in Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. same British colonization. Mm -hmm. It's so Nigerian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that it, my impression was that India was the same, that it was just Indian. Mm -hmm. And Indian in so many ways that I knew I wouldn't ever understand anything. Mm -hmm. They have something like 16 official languages mm -hmm. with different writing systems. And it all looks like beautiful, embro beautiful embroidery. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I, you are weaving, you, you're sort of weaving Africa as you go. You're kind of knitting. <laughs> mm. You're kind of knitting a quilt, and you're mm -hmm. in Brazil, and you're in India, and you're in Paraguay, and you're in South Carolina, <laughs> you're in South Carolina. Yeah. Did you, have you had, what have you experienced in your journey that has made you sad about exploring the Africa? Ooh. Well, I was sad this year. I went to Paraguay, and I went to Paraguay because I wanted to attend the Feast for St. Balthazar, mm -hmm. King St. Balthazar, the African Magus, the African wise man mm -hmm. who visited baby Jesus. Mm -hmm. And in the Americas, the only African diasporan community that has him as their patron saint and has a celebration for him. What's his name again? Balthazar. Balthazar, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. what is it, Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthazar. Mm -hmm. um, so only this group of Afro-Paraguayans celebrates him mm -hmm. on January 6th, Three Kings Day, Epiphany. Mm -hmm. So I've been saying, oh, I really need to go, I really need to go. Well, some, at some point you just have to go. Yeah. What made me sad about them was uh, here is this very small group. There are three separate Afro-Paraguayan groups, but the one that's near the capital is the most dynamic one. Mm -hmm. There are very few of them, so they have to outmarry. Otherwise, they'd have to marry their sister or their cousin. Mm -hmm. So they are losing their Afro-phenotype. Mm -hmm. so outmarry, meaning marry, marry outside somebody outside of their community. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So they're losing their phenotype, mm -hmm. and their little neighborhood Mm -hmm. is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. So mm -hmm. they're losing their land. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, uh, I wonder how long they will continue to have a specific identification mm -hmm. as Afro-Paraguayans. Mm -hmm. What I found fascinating was I suddenly realized that they're the only group in the Americas that has a name for themselves that is an African ethnic name. They're called Kamba. Mm -hmm. and um, one of them would say, yes, we Kamba, we black people, mm -hmm. nosotros negros. Mm -hmm. Now, he wasn't terribly negro, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, because of the miscegenation. Um, so that made me sad, because I wondered, are they going to survive as a group? And the whole southern cone of, of South America, um, Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, mm -hmm. the groups are very small, and they're losing an Afro, an identifiable Afro phenotype. Mm -hmm. So they're becoming conscious mm -hmm. of their African origins mm -hmm. as they're looking less and less like their African ancestors and are less and less subject to the kind of discrimination that was a product of being brown, Typically, curly hair. when one thinks of a Bolivian, <laughs> they do not think of dark. Right. You spent time there. <laughs> Tell us about that journey. Well, the first Bolivian I met, uh, I met him in New York, and he said, I'm Juan Angola Maconde from Bolivia. We have no African culture. Mm. So I looked at this very chocolate man mm -hmm. with very African kind of hair, and I said, you invented the name. He said, oh, no, there are a lot of Angolas and a lot of Macondes as family names. Mm -hmm. So well, how do you manage to have no African culture with mm -hmm. all those names? Mm -hmm. Now, they're another case, though. They, I, it, they don't have a lot of identifiable African culture mm -hmm. because they're a very small population, mm -hmm. and they have been surrounded by indigenous people for forever. Mm -hmm. Their music dance style, for example, now they still have drums, mm -hmm. they still dance. They were getting away from it in their desire to assimilate, but then as a result of the consciousness raising mm -hmm. that in the late 90s, early 2000s, they have reclaimed their dance step. Mm -hmm. And um, I had only seen young people do it, and they have, you know, little, some moves. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to see the old people. What did they do? Well, they're pretty static. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're not, uh, you know, they don't have the moves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, and I think that's the, the indigenous influence. Well, I played some of the music for a, a, a Congolese musician. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, they're, just, they're missing a drum. Mm. There's one rhythm missing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you were to hear that rhythm, you would hear the Africanity of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they're conscious now of maintaining their identity, expressing it through music and dance. And one of the things that, I have video from all these places in the world, yeah. and I was looking over my video, and I thought, the stereotype is true. Every place we are, we are singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, isn't that a little trivial just mm -hmm. to sing and dance? Mm -hmm. Then I read an article written by a Congolese um, linguist. And he was talking about Congo Square and the s music, singing, dancing, drumming that went on in Congo Square, Congo Square in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And he, one of the dances in colonial Congo Square was the bambula. Mm -hmm. And he put that, he said, this is a, this is a, a Bantu word, a, a, a Kikongo word from the Congo kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he uh, put it in the context of a phrase that I can't cite, mm -hmm. <laughs> that meant we are dancing so as not to forget. We are dancing so as to remember our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And what he said was that this music and dancing is colonizing African space in the Americas. Well, that takes it to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes music and dance not mm -hmm. just fun, mm -hmm. but also a connector mm -hmm. with roots. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't know what we're doing, we're all doing something very similar all over the place. Which brings me <laughs> right to the next. You have a book. Mm -hmm. Your book is called African Roots, American Culture. Why did you write that? Because <laughs> I had to. <laughs> and what message do you want the reader to get from it? Mm -hmm. I, had a, I organized a conference. I used to teach, I directed the Center for African and African American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And I got some money from UNESCO and organized a conference on the African diaspora and the modern world. And I invited people from South America as well as major scholars from Africa, US, various places. And one of the uh, people from South America said, well, I'll talk about discrimination and how oppressed we are. And I said, no, not here. Oh, no, no, I'm sick of that, that, that narrative. Mm -hmm. No, this victim. is about, yeah, mm -hmm. no, we don't do victims here. Mm -hmm. No, you're not going to come to crime. I'm not sending you a plane ticket for that. What I asked you to talk about was contributions of Afro-Uruguayans to the nation. Mm -hmm. I asked you to talk about what is your culture? What, what's, how do you identify Afro-Uruguayan culture? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And he did a very good job. <laughs> but the, is, the, the message is that Africa contributed to the creation of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And not just on the level of music and dance, but also on the level of music and dance. One of the, one fact I learned at this conference I organized was the demographics of the Americas. Mm -hmm. Until the beginning of the 1800s, 6.5 million people crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Europe and Africa to come to the Americas. 6.5 million. Yeah. One million came from Europe. Mm -hmm. Five and a half million came from Africa. Mm -hmm. So that means for over 300 years, almost everybody in the Americas, the Native Americans having been mm -hmm. genocided, mm -hmm. almost everybody in the Americas was African and African descendant. Mm -hmm. Well, then how can you even think about talking about the history of the Americas without the huge majority of the population? Mm -hmm. So there's that. There's uh, the technology, gold, when Europeans discovered the gold of the indigenous people, they didn't know how to extract it. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They went to what they called a costa da mina, the gold coast, yeah. now Ghana, and got Africans they knew, mm -hmm. knew mining, mm -hmm. metallurgy. Mm -hmm. um, and they called them negros minas. Mm -hmm. So mining black folks in Brazil, in Ecuador, Colombia. You, you are an anthropologist. You're an educator. Having this vast experience about, about the diaspora 
and how in every corner of the universe, uh, every corner of the world, <laughs> Africans exist. The United States is supposed to be the most advanced country. What does it say about its educational system that it has so significantly eliminated Africa from its textbooks? Well, I think that the issue is a lack of desire to tell the truth. Um, now, I don't know when I learned about slavery, but it wasn't, I didn't learn about it a long time ago. So I wasn't ashamed of it. Of it. I wasn't mad. I just didn't know anything, mm -hmm. which is shocking mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the economic basis of the Americas right. is African. Right. The Industrial Revolution was done by, was the result of all that free African labor. Mm -hmm. um, and the reparations paid to Europeans at the end of slavery and what was called compensated emancipation. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know that, then we don't know the story. We don't know how we got here. Yeah. And that's totally, uh, I mean, if you, that means our educational system is really teaching lies yes. if it's not teaching the truth. I think there are only two possibilities, mm -hmm. the truth or lies. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you leave out such a huge part of the story, mm -hmm. then you t you're, why are you hiding the truth? Mm -hmm. What do you want us to not know? Why don't you tell us that Africans were specifically recruited for knowledge and technology? Rice, we started with the Geechees yeah. and the Gullah. Yeah. Rice culture in the United States is African. Mm -hmm. The rice that was brought to the, um, to the um, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana mm -hmm. is African rice. Rice domesticated in Africa is not Asian rice. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other um, species of rice. And they, uh, planters would ask ship captains to bring rice Negroes mm -hmm. because they had the technology. Rice was the first food commodity traded in the Atlantic world. And this is rice from the Senegambia, rice from the Niger River, rice mm -hmm. from Sierra Leone, from the Grain Coast. If we were taught that, we would have a different kind of self-image. Yes. We yes. would understand that we were not just, uh, what, stoop labor. Mm -hmm. We were brought not just as bodies, but as minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. these minds all over the Americas helped develop the Americas, the, the gold. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gold, what did it do? It enriched Europe. Yeah. Um, the f foods, there are so many places in which African foods are still eaten mm -hmm. with African names intact. Mondongo. Mm -hmm. Mondongo is tripe. Mm -hmm. You can eat something called Mondongo. I had, where was I? Uh, in a Colombian restaurant mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah. I had some Mondongo, because mm -hmm. that's from Angola. Mm -hmm. Ndongo, mm -hmm. the uh, kingdom of Ndongo. <sighs> um, I've eaten Mondongo as a cultural experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From, from Argentina to Mexico. Yeah. Uh, if we knew the real story, we would, we as African de descendants, we would feel better about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We would have much more attitude. Mm -hmm. We would think we were much more entitled mm -hmm. to everything, yeah. all the goodies of the society. Yes, yes. And, but to keep us in the dark. Personal and collective self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. It's empowering to know your story, and it's disempowering to be told, like they tried to teach me when I was in graduate school, mm -hmm. that everybody had a culture yeah. but us. Yeah, yeah. Everybody but us. I ask you in your experience and in your travel, and as you knitted the quilt of the diaspora, what made you sad? We've got about two minutes left. Tell me your greatest joys. <laughs> wow. Well, to go to, to Karnataka in India mm -hmm. and see these people who look just like they could be on Howard's campus mm -hmm. and to have them look at me and say, oh, she's one of our people. Uh, I have a picture of this Afro-Indian holding a cake that says President Obama because uh -huh. they had a party for him yeah. when he won. Yeah. I went to Turkey. And I was hanging out with Afro-Turks mm -hmm. who looked like they'd be perfectly at home on Howard's campus. Mm -hmm. And they had a party for President Obama. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why do you like this man? Well, he's our blood. Mm -hmm. in, in Karnataka, in India, 
they called him an American Siddi because all the African, uh, all the Afro Indians mm -hmm. collectively are referred to as Siddis. Okay. Obama is an American That's Siddi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I am struck by the fact that we have a sense of usness mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, all over the place. We may not know the details, mm -hmm. but there's a Nicolas Guillen, Afro-Cuban poet. Um, had a, has a poem, the refrain of which is, sin conocernos nos reconoceremos. Without knowing each other, we will recognize each other. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. um, because we do, we recognize each other. Yeah. We see commonalities, and we want to know more about each other and our commonalities. Mm -hmm. I think for us to know, I showed a film that I did uh, for you know, the UNESCO Slavery Project to some kids in Brooklyn. And this film talks about Afro-Indians and talks about Afro-descendants all around the world. Mm -hmm. And one kid said, they left out some of the story. Why didn't they tell us the good parts? Why didn't they tell us that Africans were rulers mm -hmm. in India? Mm -hmm. uh, why yeah. don't they want us to know that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't they want us to know we're every place? Mm -hmm. Well. It's empowering to know that you're every place. Yeah. It's empowering to know that you're global. It's empowering to know that there are 200 million African descendants in the Americas, yeah. in the Americas, from Argentina to Chile. Yeah. So I figure, and this all began with this nice family in Cameroon, mm -hmm. that this is my extended family. Yeah. It is empowering <laughs> yeah. that, you have joined, uh, that you have joined us here today. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're that wraps us for this evening, folks. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. I'm Rock Newman. God bless you, and we'll see you the next time. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.